Bolivar of uh, South America who's given his name to Bolivia. But no country has an invented adjective, Pakistan, land of the pure. And you can see how pure I am. Pure. But at the same time, it's an acronym for place names. P for Pakistan. A for Afghania. Uh, KP now. And K, and as you know, Kashmir. Doyen, better tell your Indian guests that we are still working on Kashmir. <laughs> and S for Sindh. Tan for Balochistan, even though Balochistan didn't exist as a province at that time. And it was subliminal that Chaudhary Rahmat Ali, when he thought of this name, did not include B for our beloved uh, East Bengal. And that's why they probably left us. He had thought of Bangistan as a separate Muslim entity. But no other country comes close. We are a country that has had to adopt and develop an identity after getting our name. You're normally born with some kind of familial ethnic identity. There is no such thing as a Pakistani race. There is a Baloch race, a Sindh race, a Punjabi race. There is a migrant race like myself, which has come and adopted Sindh as our home. In about a hundred years, perhaps, we will fuse through intermarriages and create a Pakistani race. No other country was created at 10 weeks' notice. I mean, this conference, how long has it taken Sahib Saab to plan this conference? How many? One year. And look at this marvelous result. How much time did we get? There was a gentleman called Lord Mountbatten who arrives in Delhi on the 22nd of March, 1947. And within 10 weeks, he has resolved the whole complexity of Congress, Muslim League relations, India, Pakistan, Mr. Jinnah, Mr. Nehru. And out of sheer arrogance, instead of waiting till June 48, which was given to him by Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister, he arbitrarily decides 3rd June 1947, he says, I will announce the partition plan. And it's another matter that Mr. Jinnah did not want Bengal or Punjab to be partitioned because he wanted a large number of non-Muslims to live in Pakistan. On 3rd June, this gentleman says, 10 weeks from now, there shall be two new nation states. And it was not Pakistan being carved out of India, as some Western commentators even to this day misrepresent. There was no such thing as a historical singular India before 14th August 1947. There were 550 princely states in India. I belong to one. I was born in Madras, but I, my father was from Hyderabad, Deccan. It was a kingdom larger than France. It had its own currency. So India too was created on the 14th of August 1947. But India was designated the legal successor state to the British who were departing. Pakistan didn't have that advantage. New Delhi was already in place. At 10 weeks notice, you ask millions of people to move from Punjab west to east, East Bengal to West Bengal, West Bengal to East Bengal, and you want a nation state to start functioning. It has to be one of the greatest injustices imposed on any nation. And yet we survived. This is the remarkable facet of Pakistan, a country created at 10 weeks' notice without furniture and chairs for government officials in Karachi. They had to sit on the floor and look after their files. We didn't have money to pay for our, uh, for our salaries. The Nizam of Hyderabad had to secretly provide money. Uh, but we did all that. 10 weeks' notice. No other country was created with two wings separated by a thousand miles. Not a friendly territory, unfriendly territory. And this is no disrespect to India. But India's home minister was on record saying, Pakistan won't last more than six months. I tell the Americans, can you visualize the United States being born with New York on one side, California on the other, and the Soviet Union in the middle? visualize that. So they say, aha, yeah, we didn't realize that Pakistan had difficulties. 
Why do you think the armed forces became an uh, important part of our country? Because from the word go, we had insecurity to deal with. How do you deal with this incredible situation? The logistics, the air transportation, the movement of people. And no wonder then, I'm not going to go into detail, I'd much rather that you read my book, uh, Unique Origins, Unique Destiny. They should have been selling this book here. Where is Mr. Sakhir Masood? Why didn't you arrange for... <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. But that's all detailed in the book. Let me just say, for a country that was born with such enormous disadvantages, the fact that we survived up to 1971, and then thanks to our own blunders and with a little aid from India, we disintegrated. The first country after the Second World War to disintegrate uh, after 1945. But even that, we survived. We survived even the fact that the majority of the people of Pakistan, which was our Bengali brethren, rejected the name of Pakistan. I have never heard of the majority of the nation rejecting the name of the nation, developing their own, and the minority keeping care of this beautiful name, Pakistan. Nurturing it, loving it, and developing it, and making sure it lives, and making sure it will always live. So we are a crazy country. No country on this earth has been created and has survived the way we have. So when people get very upset at what Pakistan is today in the year 2011, I say it's part of the catharsis of growing up. How do you become a country created on the basis of Islam and yet it does not want to be a theocratic country like Iran? where an unelected alim, ayatullah, can overrule the decisions of an elected parliament. We are an unusual country. We are a thoroughly democratic country. Even when military dictators, with whom, one of, with whom I have served, and I have no regrets for that, because I served with Atahur Rahman, and incidentally with Atta I have one other thing in common. He and I have acted together in a play called Julius Caesar, in Karachi University, I played Cassius, and because I had the lean and hungry look, I'm still, I'm still hungry, I may not be a little lean now, but uh, Atta, Atta played the soothsayer. He comes and says, beware the Ides of March, and then he had a double role also. Later, you appeared as a military general. Uh, but coming back to the nature of our crisis today, uh, I believe that this is the catharsis we are working out all the modalities of how to be a predominantly Muslim nation state without being a theocracy and never allowing religious extremism to gain political legitimacy. And this is what has happened throughout our 64 years of history. The way people vote in Pakistan, they vote with great maturity and balance. And just because Western media shows a bunch of fanatics uh, celebrating the terrible murder of Salman Taseer does not mean they represent the vast majority of the people of Pakistan. The vast majority are very decent, balanced, good-natured, friendly people. We've looked after three million Afghan refugees for over 30 years. Name one country in the world which is willing to look after three million refugees and not just shut them into camps. They have the run of the country. They can open businesses, they can provide narcotics to us, they can sell us Kalashnikovs. Oh, 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 we are very good patrons and consumers of everything the Afghans give us. And we allow our land to be used as transit, otherwise Afghanistan's economy would not survive. So, we, we have some virtues. Currently, Pakistan faces very profound uh, crisis. It is a crisis of institutions. It's a crisis of how to stabilize while you're fighting an external war, you're fighting an internal war, and you want to protect democracy, you want to respect the judiciary, and the judiciary is very unhappy with the executive arm of government. The people are unhappy with the executive. People are always unhappy. Sometimes uh, when I read uh, uh, American media's comments about the health of American democracy,